some of, some of what I, I'm going to preach and teach and minister on tonight is, is, is going to be coming out of um, some living situations. Um, so when that happens, there's generally a person or two that's going to be like, man, this is, this is directed right at me. No, you're helping the process of God delivering a message that everyone needs to hear. Okay, uh, so oftentimes we can take it personal or we get offended. Don't do that. Okay, take it as this. God loves me so much that he's using my life or parts of my life as an example for others to be aware of if these situations was to arise in their life because it is usually and generally something that happens or has happened or generally happens in all of our lives. Okay. Um, so I want to talk to you about surrender and what does it mean to surrender to God? You know, and, and, and it's like we got this idea that, that surrendering to God is this, this one time, you know, surrender and, and, you know, I'm just, I'm done. And, and, you know, but it's kind of like I heard an old pastor say, what, you know, what's, what's the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps wanting to crawl back off of the altar, so every time that I lay this down or I lay something down, I just keep worming or wiggling my way back off and back into. And, and so continue, continual surrender. You know, there's times in our life where God will ask us to surrender to something. And then that something he asks us to surrender to, he'll actually give back to us sometime down the road when he knows we can steward over it better or use it for the proper use that it was given to be used for in the beginning. But there's sometimes there's God just wants to see if we'll say yes. You know, sometimes he just wants to see if we'll say yes to something. You know, and, and, and or if we're going to just hold on to it or God, you're going to have to you're just going to have to really make that one make sense to me. And God's like, really? Really? <laughs> oh, mortal man, <laughs> I got to explain this at your level. Right. I mean, you know, so in, in Matthew chapter 16, um, verse 13, it begins to to talk about Peter's confession. And, and it's when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Turn it to yourself, right? Before you really knew him, who did you say that he was? I mean, who does the world say that he is now? Jesus? Who's Jesus? He's just one path, one avenue, one means. He's just a part of the universal pantheism of the scope of every way leads to a God. You know, and so Jesus is usually asking a question because he's trying to get us to really think through or to, you know, ask ourselves, who do I really say Jesus is? Who is this Jesus really to me? Is this Jesus the, the, the one that I was told by my grandparents and my fathers that, that is supposed to be the truth and the way and the life? Is that who Jesus is to me? Or is Jesus just something that I add to my life and I continue to do things my way in my life? Right? You can see it all around you. You see it all the time. And then Jesus says to them, he says, but who do you say that I am? In other words, it becomes personal. I can tell you who Jesus is to me, but until who Jesus is is revealed to you, is he the son of God? Is he the Christ? Right. So it's kind of like I have to surrender my ideology of who this Jesus is and all these different pathways to be able to get to heaven. Right. Or all these worldly or earthly or American thoughts and philosophies of things. I have to surrender all this stuff to what? To what the Bible says he is. This is my guidebook. This is my instruction manual. This is my teacher, my tutor. This is what's going to teach me and tell me who he is. And he said to Simon, 
Barjona, he said, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You know, I, I, was, I was having this thought um, yesterday, and, I, and, 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 and oft, oftentimes you look around at so many Christian preachers or TV preachers or local pastors or local Christians that seem to be falling short or not carrying the name to a standard that is written in the Word of God. You know, and, and if I didn't know who Jesus was, it would be real easy for me to be able to look at that and say, if that's who Jesus is, I don't want none of that. And that's what the world's doing oftentimes. It's looking at my life and your life, and it's saying, if that's who this Jesus is, if that's all he can do for you, and if that's all he, you say that he is, then I don't want none of that because I can get better than that over here. Think about the seriousness of what I just said and, and, and so to me, so to me in this, who does G, who do you say that, who do you say that Jesus is? Because I know and because I had a personal encounter and because he came to me personally and because he revealed to himself to me and I had revelation of his truth and his power and he has forgiven me and redeemed me and set me free. I can't let who you say he is determine or decide what I have chosen that he is. I have chosen that he's God. He's the redeemer. He's the way. He's the path. He's the truth. He's the life. So because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to me, so it's oftentimes over the years, and, and some people's going to agree with this, and some people's going to disagree with this, and that's okay. You let, the G, you let Jesus work with you. I'll let him work with me in this, okay? Amen? Okay? And I think there's a time to go with a man to an altar and pray. And I think there's a time to lay hands on them and heal. And I think there's a time to stand back and let them do business with God. It's their business with God that's going to make God will reveal to them and show up for them. So over the years, many times, altar, church, altar calls at many different churches. And I'll stay in my pew as men go forward to pray. I'm with you 24-7, helping you, leading, helping guide, and pointing you to who? To who you're about to meet at that altar. Who do you say that he is when you leave there, right? So there's a time to lay hands. There's a time to pray. There's a time to comfort. There's a time for all that. There's also a time... For us to figure out and for us to surrender, right, to the Jesus of the Bible. So that's oftentimes why I don't go up with the guys when they go to pray. Because this is their journey. I'm supporting you. I'm praying for you. Don't think that I am. I mean, don't think that I'm not. Amen? You know, um, so... Unless flesh and blood reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. So this is a personal encounter. This is something that has to happen between you and God. Without it, something that happens between you and God and the Father revealing this to you and then me surrendering myself to it, right? Oftentimes, this is what you see often. We are only learning what it looks like to be a Christian. Now, I'm, I'm going to dig back into to some of my past and some of my journey. I, I learned how to do arithmetic. It's not bad. It's good. I use it today. I learned simple subtraction and simple mathematics at an early age. And as soon as they began to teach me, I began to give myself over to learning it. I began to learn the English language, and I began to learn just enough to be able to get me through class. 
I didn't have the desire. I wasn't the one that cared about a verb or a noun or how to describe what those really was, pronouns or were they adjectives or not. I didn't care about any of that stuff. Still don't fully understand it, have a master's degree in college, and still don't know how in the world I ever got by without understanding and knowing that stuff. Just never had a desire to really learn those things or those aspects of the English language. I mean, I spent a lot of time really focusing more on my handwriting. I was really particular about being neat and I wanted everything to be in order and I wanted everything to be on the line. And I didn't like it when, my, when, when, my, when everything didn't look good. So I spent a lot of my time learning those things so that I could put them to use today. But I spent a lot of my life not really using mathematics for the right reason. I really learned my quarters, my eights, my tenths, and all that in the drug industry. I didn't learn how to read a tape, believe it or not, until I was 25 years old. You can debate that. You can discuss that among yourself. Being a carpenter today and building the way that we build, I did not pick up a tape measure and learn how to read it until I was 25 going into carpentry's apprenticeship. It was actually millwright apprenticeship at the age of 25. I had to sit down with a ruler thing that had all the 16ths and the 8ths and the core orders and all that on it explain to me I didn't I didn't I didn't ever know it but I use it today I use it quite often today but I learned it for the wrong purpose and for the wrong reasons see I spent a lot of time researching on how to cook meth I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to learn all the different functionalities of the chemicals and reading a lot of different books. And at this time, the Internet wasn't so available and all that. And, and so you had to go to libraries, you had to get literal books, and, and it was hard to find these kind of books. And then you was always worried about whether you was being tracked or whether you was being traced or whether or not they, you know what I mean? I mean, ordering different magazines that would, would fill you, be able to fill you. You know, I spent a lot of time growing weed and learning how to do it. I spent a lot of time learning how to pretend and be fake and manipulate and deceive. I spent a lot of my life trying to figure out how I could be successful by not being good. You know, and now today I use those things to watch others do it or to watch others try to learn it or try to go through it or so that God uses us as a discerning mechanism and a discerning tool in people's lives. My point is, is that you can try to learn but unless you're going to use it for the right thing, you're only learning for the wrong reasons and the wrong motives. But even though I spent a lot of time and a lot of energy learning the wrong things, you know when God allowed me to begin to tap into those things? When I surrendered everything. I had to surrender everything that I had. So, so I, I'm telling you this because there was something that I had. I spoke into someone's life this week that, that rung more true, maybe more true to me than to them. I don't know. We'll see, right? But this is what I said to them. Would you be willing to trade? Would you be willing to surrender everything that you know to be free from this one thing? Is there something in my life that I have been unwilling to, to surrender over to God, right? For guys that come into this ministry, it's oftentimes it's meth, it's heroin, it's alcoholism. It's something like that. But I think that it's something deeper. It's something much deeper than just those are just superficial things of a real deeper, a lot deeper, 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 deeper issue. And when God begins to put his fingers on it and God begins to press down on it, 
and he begins to pry in this area and this place in my life. Would I be willing to even surrender the things that I think are my great attributes or my good things to be free from this thing? I think that's real surrender. There was a time in my life where God came to me and he said, take it off. What are you talking about? I'm talking about what I made a living with. My tool belt. I didn't start learning to read a tape until I was 25. God came to me at 37. I had gained and learned a lot in 12 short years. It became my power. It became my go-to. It became my money maker. It became my cover. It was what I hid behind in my drug culture and my drug dealings. I had my business aim in the front yard in my grow basement, my grow house in the basement. He said, take it off. Why? Because it was something that I used for my own manipulation, my own good, my own motives. Was building bad? No. But I needed to be taught how to build. He said to the disciples, Stop fishing. But that's what we do. That's all we know. From this day forward, you will be fishers of men. David, it's time that you build into men. Take off your tool belt, follow me, and learn how to build for me. Five years without a tool belt. Five years of preparation. Preparation. The only thing that I was allowed to learn, the only thing that God was allowing me to be taught was the Word. I didn't work. I studied. God provided. I went to school. I got the opportunity to sit underneath some of the, some of the best professors in the country. Blessed. Blessed. Surrendered. Hard. Very, very hard as a man to allow my wife to work in the daytime and me study in the day. I had to surrender. I had to surrender a lot to learn the right things and the right way to use those things. So guys, listen, this world is a battleground. It's a battleground. You can't do this discipleship thing the American gospel way. The American way will teach us how to do it the wrong way. So since the fall in the Garden of Eden, the world that God created has been in conflict with him. Satan is called the God of this world. And due to Adam's sin, we are born on his team. Naturally, I'm born into this chaotic mess. God, I need to learn how to live for you. You know, where does all of my teaching and learning come from before Christ? The world. How much of it do I still try to hold on to as I take this journey into this journey with Christ? A lot of it. See, it's, it's convicting, but it's true. You know, that, that's why Scripture says that unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, that's why I teach these men when they come here, man, you got to forget everything that you think you know so much about before you got here. You got you to just leave it alone for a while. Leave everything in Michigan in Michigan. Leave everything up north up north. And, and just use this time and this opportunity to get to know God and his word so that God can take nothing and make it into something for him, right? So when we reach the age of, you know, more, being able to make moral choices, 
we got to choose whether or not to follow our own sinful inclinations or to seek God. Right? So God promises that when we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. That's beautiful. When we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. So we have a choice to make. Do we continue to follow our own inclinations? Or do we surrender to his will? Surrender is a battle term. Have you ever thought about that? It's one thing to say, I surrender all. I surrender, I surrender all. I surrender all. Well, it implies giving up your rights to the conqueror. It's a battle term. Surrender. Surrendering your rights to the conqueror. So when an imposing army surrenders, you just let them keep their guns. You let them keep their knives. No. You make them lay down everything. They lay down their arms and the, and the winner takes control from then on. It's about control. I want to be in control, but that's not surrender. I want to do it my way, but that's not surrender. But I have a, it, but that's not surrender. The winner, the conqueror, takes control. So surrendering God, surrendering to God works the same way. God has a plan for our lives. And surrendering to him means we set aside our own plans and eagerly seek his. That's hard to do in this world in the, in, in the American age that we live in today. I get it. But the good news is, is that God's plan for us is always in our best interest. Dave, we say that, do we set, not say that to every guy that comes in here? It's going to seem as if, it's going to seem as if, but we really do, we really do have your best interest at hand. And the best interest for you is God's interest in you. So unlike our own plans that often lead to destruction, our Lord is wise and a beneficent victor. Listen to this. Write this down. He conquers us to bless us. He conquers us to bless us, protect us. So there's different levels and there's different kinds uh, of surrender, all of which affect our relationship with God. Initial surrender to the drawing of the Holy Spirit leads to salvation. And when we let our own attempts to earn God's favor and rely upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, we become children of God. It's beautiful, man. By faith, we are sons of God, right? Sons and daughters of God. But there are times of greater surrender during a Christian's life. And those times are meant to bring deeper intimacy with God and to bring greater power in service with God. There's no way that you can serve God continually, fully with everything you have without complete surrender to God, right? When you're completely surrendered to God in service for God, you're going to be mistreated. It doesn't feel good. You're going to feel like a doormat oftentimes. It goes against everything that the world would tell you that you should be, and how you should be treated. I have to give up a lot of American comforts, ideologies, and thoughts, and ways. And Greater surrender 
brings a deeper intimacy with God. The more areas of our lives we surrender to him, the more room there is for the filling of the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with his spirit, we exhibit traits of his character, fruits of the spirit. The more we we surrender to God, the more of our old worshiping nature is replaced with one that resembles Christ, our old self-worshiping nature. We do things because we feel good. I'll be honest with you, a lot of things that God asks me to do don't always feel good for me. There's a lot of things that God has called me to do that I don't necessarily enjoy doing. But at the same time, I have joy. And I think that that is because that we are to live in constant surrender. And when you're in surrender, there's a conqueror over your life. I'm not my own. I don't belong to me. So I stop searching for the things that make me feel good to do the things that makes God feel good. It's tough. Being surrendered oftentimes means I have to lay down my weapons of warfare the things that I would use to explain myself, defend myself, excuse myself. Don't do me no good. Conquered. Romans 6.13 says that God demands that we surrender the totality of ourselves. He wants it all. I know this message can be really scary. It's like, really? All? Not just part, but all? He wants all? (sighs) Scripture says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, that his followers must deny themselves. Another call to surrender. So the goal of the Christian life can be summed up in this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Such a life of surrender is pleasing to God. It results in the greatest human fulfillment and will reap the ultimate rewards in heaven. See, the last thing I think you really want to do is just learn how to be a Christian. I think that if you look out into our world today, you'll see a lot of people learning how to do whatever they think will benefit them at the point in the time and, you know, fulfill the desires or wants in their life. There was a time in my life where I was around good, godly Christian men, and I learned by watching them what a Christian was. But I wasn't a Christian. I thought I was. But I had never surrendered. And because I had never surrendered to Christ, I wasn't crucified with Christ. We talk about this at the ministry a lot. Guys coming in, you're going to have to surrender. We talk about it a lot, don't we? Because when you see an unwillingness to surrender, you know that it's probably going to get bad before it gets better unless they do. And your heart hurts for that. I don't want to see 
anything worse happen. Jesus said, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. In other words, surrender to me. Amen. So that's the message that God put on my heart tonight was, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to learn and maybe we should spend more time just surrendering. There's nothing wrong with learning. It can be good. There's nothing wrong with having talents and skills and trades. They can be good. But God wants it all, right? So what he allows me to have and to use, I want it to have been filtered through surrender. Filter it, God, through surrender. In other words, take it all from me. Take it all and then give me back what you want me to have. And, and just give it back to me as, as I can use it properly. God is good, amen, and he loves you very much. Amen, okay? So the difference between um, rules and God's love, right? God, through Scripture, is going to have rules for us to live by, okay? Um, Pastor Lyndon said it good this morning, man. Um, there was a time in my life where all I seen was the rules of being a Christian, the rules of, of, of Christianity, the rules of the preacher, the rules of God. I didn't want anything to do with the rules, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do or when to do. But when I'd surrendered my life to him, I seen that the rules was love. That's God's love for me. He loves me that much that he's helping me. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen.